I feel somewhat diffident about giving a lecture on Paul because the study of Paul is a tremendously specialist and complex thing, and I'm a mere Old Testament uh, specialist, though I've also taught courses in my Durham days um, on the Dead Sea Scrolls and intertestamental Judaism. So it's with some trepidation that I address myself to Paul, but perhaps I can give you a little bit of autobiography here so that you can see where I'm coming from. I came into Christian faith through the teaching of Jesus, particularly the parables of the kingdom of God. And it took me some while to come to terms with Paul. I think this was partly because of unhelpful ways um, that people spoke and even wrote about Paul. But my engagement with Paul has been a long journey. It has been a very rewarding journey because the more I have studied Paul, and I've done it a great deal, I have come to appreciate Paul for my own Christian faith and uh, to see what a debt we owe to Paul as an interpreter and preacher of the gospel. So that's my sort of autobiography and explains how and why I am coming to Paul. Really, very much more from an Old Testament background, whereas I think Pauline specialists tend to do it more from a, a Greek, Greco-Roman background. Well, it's no surprise that Paul, having spent the first part of his adult life, perhaps most of his adult life, as a Pharisee and an observant Jew, one who had studied in Jerusalem, it's no surprise that he is rooted in the Old Testament and in that special relationship that I was talking about when we dealt with the Old Testament. So it's no surprise that um, in Romans he quotes from Psalm 32, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. But for Paul... God, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, has created a new special relationship, and it has universal and it has cosmic um, implications. Uh, for these latter, I'm referring to Romans 8.22, that enigmatic passage where Paul talks about the creation groaning in travail and being in bondage um, and looking forward to the revealing of the sons of God. And alas, he doesn't elaborate on that, though from an Old Testament point of view, one cannot help thinking of those great passages in Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 65 that envisage a new heaven and a new earth um, where you get the vegetarian lion um, a creation freed um, from the violence that inhabits it. Uh, they shall neither hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. And we shall see later on, of course, you see that Paul has this tremendous sense that things that will happen at the end of the age are happening now. And if at the end of the age the, the creation is to be renewed, then there's a sense in which that can or should be happening now. Now, Paul has various phrases for this new dimension of grace. So, Colossians 1.13, God hath delivered us from the pose, not the poser of darkness, I apologise uh, for the misprint, uh, from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And he speaks on more than one occasion about, about the kingdom. And then in Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And being in Christ Jesus is another of the phrases that he uses for this new special 
relationship that God has created. But the importance of this for the forgiveness of sins is not that God has now made um, these Old Testament facilities available universally, but that God's forgiveness operates universally in a new dimension, a new dimension created by God through Jesus Christ, a dimension that stands over and against the normal world. This is the significance, of course, of Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female. Within this new special relationship, you have human relationships that stand as opposed to what was normal in the world at the time. And in 2 Corinthians 5.17, we have the words, if any man is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old is done away with all. Behold, all things have become new. So we're talking about a new special relationship, a new dimension of grace that is universal and cosmic in its implications, but standing opposed to what we might call the, the normal, unredeemed world. And this has all come about because of this very difficult concept of the righteousness of God. Now, in Greek and also in Hebrew, um, these words righteousness, just, justified, to justify, all center in the Greek around this sort of uh, verbal stem of dik, dikaiosene, dikaios, dikaioo. And of course, in Hebrew, similarly, you, you get a connection between tzedakah, tzedek, hitzdik, um, meaning to, to justify righteousness and so on. Now, God's righteousness is not what God is. God's righteousness is what he does. It is the exercise of his sovereignty in putting things and people right. And there's a lovely quotation from T.W. Manson's book on Paul and John, where he says, God acts not as administrator of the law, but as king in his own kingdom and father of his own children. And this righteousness, what has happened, has been achieved in and through Christ. So this important passage, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And he goes on to talk about the, the ministry of reconciliation with which he has been entrusted. And we begin to see in Paul's teaching here that element of absurdity that we noticed last week in the teaching of Jesus. Remember when I was talking about the parable of the prodigal son and how this parable um, could upset people when they feel that all the loyal service of the elder brother uh, was, was brushed aside, was all for nothing, and that the treatment by the father of the prodigal was really scandalous. This young man who has wasted his substance in riotous living and comes crawling back, a disreputable feature, and yet the father is looking out for him, runs to him, embraces him, uh, orders the, the robe and all this to be done to him, this element of absurdity. And this element of absurdity comes through in the teaching of Paul. What God has done in Jesus in setting up this new special relationship defies normal logic. 1 Corinthians 1.23 We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them that are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And when I say on the handout and see the continuation with an exclamation mark, we have the words there, the wisdom of God is wiser than men. This is a lesson that the church is very reluctant to learn, that the wisdom of God 
is wiser than men because one of the difficulties about this whole subject, the atonement forgiveness, is human, the, the refusal of the church uh, to acknowledge that the wisdom of God is wiser than men. The desire of the church to hold God accountable to our ideas of justice and forgiveness and so on. So, so see the continuation, the wisdom of God is wiser than men. We have to let God be done, be God. And what he does defies normal logic. Romans 5, 6 to 8. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we come to this phrase, justification by faith. What is it? And I would say that justification by faith is the discovery and acknowledgement by individuals that Christ died for the ungodly. That is for them. And when I say compare Galatians 2.20, we have again a, a, a verse I shall come back to later on, but he says, um, he, the life I now live in the faith, says Paul, I live in the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is a de declaration, if you like, of justification by faith, the discovery that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me, and the transforming effect that that realisation and that discovery can have upon the life of individuals and communities. Now, Christ's death and resurrection have implications for law and the law. Paul does not believe in an immoral universe. He knows the good news um, of God um, coming to judge the world. Um, and so, uh, I mean, um, we get in, um, in Psalm 98, um, the, the, the joyous acclamation. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth. With righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity. Judgment is part of the good news. Part of the good news because... I don't want to live in a world where it doesn't matter whether you're Adolf Hitler or, or Mother Teresa, whatever uh, things you might um, say about Mother Teresa, have tried to say. I don't want to live in that sort of world, a world that is totally indifferent morally. And the idea that God will judge is good news. And Paul says that we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ and Paul speaks of God's wrath in Romans 1, 18. Now, of course, we hear this idea, the, the wrath of God is revealed. We say, oh dear, oh dear, this is the Old Testament God of wrath. We don't want that. Uh, we want the New Testament God of love. And yet, whether or not the word wrath or anger is appropriate, I would somehow feel let down if I thought that God was indifferent to the many things in the world that make me angry. I am angry at the way in which the wealth of this world is so unjustly distributed. I am angry at the way in which we are devastating the created order with which we have been entrusted. I am angry that women and children are abused and I don't have to go on. I'm sure you can add to the list and you can say, yes, we are angry, rightly angry about these things. We don't want to live in a world where these things are going to have the last word. And the assurance that we have 
of the Old Testament speaking of God coming to judge the world, of us having to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, however we understand that, and Paul speaking about God's orga, his wrath revealed against wickedness. All this is, is right. God's judgment against lawlessness in a world where men worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, Romans 1, 25. And law is necessary. We cannot have an ordered society without it, and our politicians are constantly talking about the rule of law. But we have to take one step beyond that. Law and the Jewish law have their limitations, and Paul should have been, I would have thought, aware um, of the teaching of uh, one of the great Jewish teachers, uh, Simeon the Just. Um, we don't know exactly who he was. He might have been the high priest round about 280, might have been a later descendant, perhaps round about 200. But in that most important document um, of Jewish ethics, the sayings of the fathers, the Pirkei Avot, we have this extremely important statement. Um, I'll read it in Hebrew and then you can have the English. Al shaloshad varim ha'olam omed, al ha'torah, al ha'avada, va'al gomilut chasadim. On three things the world stands. There are three things of fundamental importance. The law or the Torah, worship, and a marvellous phrase, difficult to translate, uh, imparting of kindnesses. So, in addition to the law, you have worship. The importance of worship is that we ascribe the glory to God. We realise our littleness in relation to him. And then the imparting of kindnesses is, covers that area of life where law cannot have any place at all those acts of generosity, of goodwill, um, visiting the city, doing all those things that cannot be prescribed by law. And I think one of the things that has been so tragic in the recent history of our country is the way in which so many things, teaching, the health service, these used to run on the imparting of kindnesses. People used to run classes after school, used to go and uh, you know, take, take people on school trips, um, you know, have child classes. And then suddenly along come the politicians and say, no, we, you've got to have a contract. It's got to be regulated by law. And all of a sudden, those um, acts of kindness get, get snuffed out because if people are going to be treated as though they have got to be you know, st st stuck to the little, then they will. And this sense of the imparting of kindnesses is a very important thing. And this is a very profound insight within the Judaism that Paul, I think, knew or, or should have known. But Paul then goes further, which is so interesting. Galatians 3.21, if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness could have been by the law. Because for the early Christians, as they looked at the death of Christ, for them, law and sin showed their limitations by crucifying Christ. When we read the Passion on Good Friday, we see this at work. We, we see how people um, do things against their better judgment, that there is an air of hypocrisy, of unreality, uh, which then leads the, to the convenience of crucifying Christ and brings with it in the process that innate brutality in human nature, which when it gets the chance to victimise and bully, will do so. So the death of Christ exposes the weaknesses of the law and it also defeated the people Paul calls the princes of this world. Now, I shall come on to those a little bit later on, but this is a very important part of Paul's teaching. 
So closely allied to Paul's teaching about the limitations of law and the Jewish law as his important distinction between the letter and the spirit. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. The letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. And here we see a link from Paul back to the ministry of Jesus. Because as we see the ministry of Jesus in the Gospels, there is the same conflict. Jesus is accused of being a lawbreaker. His disciples pluck ears of corn on the Sabbath. Jesus heals people on, on, on the Sabbath and so on. And he lays down the idea that the law, the Sabbath law, it has its limitations. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And in his teaching about the Holy Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians, Paul lists all these things, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, um, self-control, against which he says significantly, there is no law. So, this is the first problem with the law. Although law is necessary, although judgment is something to be welcomed, there is another dimension also, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And this governs that part of life um, which appeals to our generosity, uh, and indeed it appeals from a biblical point of view, to responding to what I call the imperatives of redemption that I was talking about with regard to the Old Testament. The law, number six, in league with sin, human vulnerability, and principalities of powers, has imprisoned and enslaved the human race. Now, these principalities and powers that are hinted at darkly, Romans 8, 38, they're not mentioned together in that, but Paul says that um, the love of God um, cannot separate us from principalities or powers, and then the references to these come elsewhere. Um, we can understand that, at least I understand it, against the background of what we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The writers of the community rule among the Dead Sea Scrolls um, speak there of what is called the Angel of Darkness. And the people of the Covenant community, um, who are called the Children of Light, find themselves uh, ranged against the Children of Darkness. And the Children of Darkness are controlled by what the covenant is called the angel of darkness, but the angel of darkness also interferes in the activities of the, of the children of light. And there's one passage which puts down all their weaknesses and failings to the action of the angel of darkness. Now, I think Paul also realizes that in addition to um, powers of darkness, there are all the structural things that govern human life, which can also, as it were, imprison um, humans, stop them from doing and being what they want to be. Now, there's been a lot of recent writing about this, and uh, an American scholar, Walter Wink, um, has um, done some work on this. W whether it is in convincing entirely is another matter. But I think from our point of view, we are not necessarily bound to believe in powers of darkness um, or personal devil or whatever. Except to that, it seems that the reality is this, that weakness and sin are such that they draw their strength from us. They draw their strength from the wrong choices that we make. This is what uh, Genesis chapter 4 is all about, the, the story of Cain and Abel. Um, and Abel makes this decision. And Abel is told that sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you. And when we try to do good things, um, try to defend people um, who are being threatened by dictators and so on, as soon as we open the door, somehow a wickedness in 
some seemingly organized sort of semi-personal way seems to come in and take control and suddenly it is beyond our control. So the important thing is not so much how we think of it conceptually, but that we recognize the reality. And this then brings me on to that astonishing passage in Romans chapter 7 that has caused so much controversy and disagreement. I'm referring here to Romans chapter 7, um, beginning from verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not, for the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, this has generated an enormous amount of discussion, especially if it's seen simply personally. Is this Paul speaking before he became a Christian? Is this Paul speaking after he became a Christian? Well, if we have to choose between these alternatives, I would say that he's describing his situation after he becomes a Christian. But one can take this in a wider sense, and I want to take this in a wider sense, in terms of the general frustrations for Christians, indeed for sensitive and religious people, in an imperfect world. I think I said on the occasion when I preached on the 50th anniversary of my ordination here, and I said that in my first few weeks after being ordained, I realized that if I wanted to do all the things that were necessary to be done, I would kill myself in a matter of months. And you begin with this sense, you know, the conversion of the world in our generation, and then you begin to realize your own weakness, your own limitations, the limitations of the systems with which we have to work. And I wonder how many people there are who want to do good things, and yet in the world organized as it is, you cannot necessarily achieve them. Indeed, the consequences of doing good may sometimes be bad and the other way around. And I think these words in Romans 7, however they may have described some of Paul's inner uh, turmoils, also describe our dilemma in the world in which we live, a, a world in which we, we want to do good, and yet very often we cannot do it. And a world also in which sometimes we cannot avoid doing what we do not want to do. We sometimes found ourselves confronted with choices where we have to choose between the lesser evil when we wouldn't want to do either of these evils. So there is something tremendously paradoxical here, and I think that in terms of paragraph 6, this is expressing the tensions that there will be if we are concerned to try to be true to what God has done in Jesus Christ and live and apply these things in the world around us. There is a sense, therefore, in which sin and lawlessness and so on, for all that law is important, um, has us imprisoned. And we might cry out with Paul, how are we going to get out of this? But we will have to say, somehow, I thank God through Jesus Christ. 
Now, when we come to paragraph seven, we come to this whole business of what we might call the eschatology. I mentioned it right at the beginning when I said uh, that Paul's vision of the world, of the created order in travail, wait, waiting for release, takes us back, or at least takes me back, to Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah 65, these things that are going to happen um, at the end of the age. And in Old Testament thinking, the Holy Spirit is the gift of the age to come. But for Paul and his followers, the age to come has come now, even within the limitations of a world not fully redeemed. And this is consonant, of course, with, with the preaching of Jesus. The time has drawn near. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom is operating in the ministry of Jesus and people are being invited to enter into that kingdom of right relationships. And because of this, there is a dialectical tension in Paul between the present and the future. And the forgiveness of sins within this new cosmic special relationship is one that sets up conflict with a world still dominated by law, sin, principalities and powers and disregard of God. And this is what I'm going to have to try to pull together next week when I try to see how the Christian view of the forgiveness of sins within its proper Christian setting has to confront and talk to a world which has taken the words forgiveness and sins and used them in their own way and we have to see how we confront them. And one of the ways we confront them is by the proclamation of the gospel. And the proclamation of the gospel is not an offer of success within the limitations of a world not fully redeemed. It is a challenge to the very foundations of that world. And hearing and following the gospel leads to conflict and suffering, and those are well illustrated in Paul's life and ministry and by the dialectical nature of his utterances. And I've given you three examples there. 1 Corinthians 15.10 by the grace of God I am what I am, he says. Yet I worked harder than all of them, talking about the other others. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. And then we have this remarkable one, 2 Corinthians 6, 8 to 10. By honour and dishonour, by evil report, and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. And then Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I live, but Christ lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh I live in the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So we're beginning to see, I hope, that in Paul as I understand him, the forgiveness of sins operates within this new special dimension of grace which God has created through Jesus Christ, a dimension of grace that contains the spirit rather than the letter, the absurdity of a God who justifies the ungodly. And yet, it is this reality that has to confront the world, people to be invited into this reality, to see terms, life in terms of this reality. So we come to paragraph 8. Paul expected the imminent return of Jesus, as did the first generations of Christians. And as this parousia, this appearing expectation receded, Christian thought accommodated itself 
to a one-dimensional, non-eschatological view of reality, in which the church occupies the place of the special relationship and now provides a system of forgiveness designed mainly to ensure entry into the world to come. And I say that this was a betrayal of the teaching of Paul and Jesus, is indicated by the various radical movements within Christianity that have arisen from time to time. Movements that have not been content with this idea that we live in a one-dimensional world where somehow the gospel is, is fitted into the normal state of affairs um, in its most bizarre form. You have the prosperity gospel uh, in some parts of the world where, where to be a Christian is a way to get material blessing within the terms of this world, uh, an awful distortion. Um, it seems to me, of the teaching of Jesus and, and Paul. Um, and so we've had various things. The monastic movement, for example, uh, the attempt to live alternative lifestyles. I mean, our abbey here um, uh, connects with that. And while we think that some of the manifestations of this might have been rather bizarre, the people who sat at the top of um, pillars and, uh, and so on, in order, in order to be on their own, um, or, or we, we think of the various charismatic movements beginning very in the early church with the Montanists and the... Um, the, the, the prophetesses. Um, in our own days, um, one of the attractions of the charismatic movement, whatever we may think of it, it is that there are people talking about energies uh, that, that challenge what normally goes on in the world, the gifts of the Spirit, uh, an emphasis that something um, is happening or should be happening um, that, that points forward to, to the consummation. So, at the end of this, my journey into Paul, I have to ask myself now, how can I next week take these insights from Paul and Jesus and articulate a Christian view of the forgiveness of sins that will come into dialogue, challenging dialogue, with a world that does not understand the Christian use of these terms, a world which has its own uses of these terms, but a world that desperately needs to hear and to know the Christian uses and understanding of these terms.